All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Eugene, uh, a member of research staff here at PARC. Um, today, I'm happy to introduce uh, Megan, uh, Megan Blewett, um, she, who will be our speaker today. Uh, an early stage investor at Venrock, um, which is a venture capital firm um, founded in 1969 as the venture arm of the Rockefeller family. Their, their office is actually located just across the street uh, from Park um, on the other side of Foothill Expressway. Um, she focuses on biotech and pharmaceutical investments. And um, prior to Venrock, um, Megan was a Hertz Fellow uh, with Bren, uh, Ben Cravat at uh, Scripps, where she earned a PhD in chemistry. Um, her PhD work explored the mechanism of action of the multiple sclerosis uh, therapeutic um, tech Fidera, um, and it helped found, uh, form the foundation of the biotech company Vividian. Um, you know, Megan has been continually thinking about the impact of human diseases um, through college, through graduate school, and then um, now in her role as Benrock. You know, um, one of my first memories of Megan um, when I met her in college at Harvard was um, her introduction. Hi, I'm Megan and I like multiple sclerosis. <laughs> well, I thought, you know, wow, that was unusual. You know, she could also have said that um, she enjoys running, picking locks, and cultivating eccentric hobbies because all of those are true too. Um, so Megan received an, um, a bachelor's and master's in chemistry from Harvard, uh, where she also worked in the lab of uh, Nobel Prize laureate um, E.J. Corey and she was awarded the um, Hoops Prize for her senior thesis research. And most recently, uh, she was selected for the Forbes 2019 edition of uh, 30 Under 30 list for healthcare. So today, please welcome Megan as she speaks at today's Park Forum. Um, thanks so much, Eugene, um, and thank you all for coming. I wanna mention, um, when I first met Eugene, um, he also had an unusual way of introducing himself. He had done time in the Singaporean military before going to college, so he was older than the rest of us by three years. And he said, uh, hi, I'm Eugene, and I'm old enough to be creepy. So that was, that was his introduction. Um, uh, so, uh, so like I said, thank you all for coming. Um, as a brief aside before I get started, my dad is a computer scientist, and as I was growing up, he would often tell me stories about Park and about how the work that has been done here has fundamentally shaped computing as we know it, and we're all beneficiaries of work that's been done here, so I'm incredibly excited to, to be here. Um, uh, as Eugene alluded to, uh, today I'm gonna be talking about the pharmaceutical industry and, and therapeutics. I've had a longstanding interest in multiple sclerosis uh, since I was a kid. Uh, and the problem is usually when you read about the pharmaceutical industry in the news, it's bad. It's usually not for a good reason. Usually it's about high drug prices. Uh, we saw some of that this week. Um, sometimes it's because a pharmaceutical company is doing something to extend patent life on a drug. Um, you know, all things that happen and are uh, certainly, certainly don't reflect well on our industry. But today I want to give a story about the pharmaceutical industry that's a little bit more hopeful and talk specifically about an area where the industry has had an overwhelmingly positive impact uh, on society, uh, and especially on people uh, who are extremely sick. And this is the area of rare diseases. Uh, we'll define those as diseases that affect fewer than 200,000 people in the US, and there's actually many such diseases. Uh, so that'll be the first half of the talk, uh, learnings and successes in the area of rare disease. And for the second half of the talk, I'm gonna be discussing uh, an area of extreme unmet need today, which is the opioid epidemic and, and chronic pain. And I want you to think of the second half of the talk as more of a brainstorming session than um, anything formal because uh, we don't have answers to the opioid epidemic. And I hope this will be the beginning of a discussion about how we might apply learnings from the Orphan Drug Act to the opioid crisis. Okay, uh, so let's get started. Um, as Eugene mentioned, I work at Venrock, uh, which is right across the street. Uh, my colleague Ray is in the audience, she's amazing. And, uh, <laughs> and we've been around since 1969, so we're celebrating our 50th anniversary uh, this year. And these are just some of the people that uh, I get to work with on a daily basis. 
Uh, you've probably been able to infer that not all of them have been at the firm since its founding in 1969. Some of them did join more recently than that, myself included. But I think something that uh, does unite all of us is we want to use science and technology to make the world a better place in general. Uh, and there's two ways in which we approach that. Uh, the first is uh, through healthcare investing, which is my area of focus. And the second is through tech investing. And the firm has a very strong um, tech history and, and tech pedigree. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, tech savvy individuals in the audience. So uh, some of the firm's early investments were uh, Apple and Intel, more recently companies like Dollar Shave Club, AppNexus, and Nest, which is also a stone's throw from here. Uh, okay. So I focus primarily on the therapeutic space, uh, and these are just a few of the therapeutics companies that Venrock has backed over the years, uh, including a few that you might have heard of. So companies like Gilead, which today is the maker of a drug, Sovaldi, uh, which has shown uh, an ability to cure over 95% of hepatitis C cases in just 12 weeks of treatment. So before Sovaldi, uh, hepatitis C patients were uh, essentially uh, had to take lifelong interferon therapy, which is a slew of really uh, negative side effects. So this has been a transformational medicine. Um, IDEC, Biogen IDEC, was the initial developer of rituximab, which uh, was initially used to treat uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but today is used to treat a wide variety of autoimmune diseases. So the, the bottom line is the companies on these slides have had a big impact on, on many people. And today I want to talk about how you actually build a company like this. Uh, and I want to talk about that not because I have done this, but because I certainly aspire to do that someday. And it's a very long road to go from an idea to uh, a company like the ones you just saw. But in uh, very, very simple terms, uh, there's three general steps. And the first step to building a therapeutics company is to have some new piece of science. And this we'll put into two categories, new biology and new technology. Uh, so new biology might be, for instance, discovering specific mutations in a cancer that drive the progression of that cancer. Uh, and before uh, scientists had mapped out these sorts of driver mutations in cancer, uh, the best way we had to distinguish a cancer cell from a normal cell was the fact that cancer cells divide more rapidly. But of course, normal cells also divide, so this wasn't a really uh, great way to distinguish cancer cells from normal cells. But once we knew that the DNA of cancer cells was fundamentally different than the DNA of normal cells, it enabled a whole new generation of targeted cancer therapies. So that's an example of new biology. An example of new technology would be uh, something like CRISPR gene editing. So we've known for a while there's many diseases that have some genetic basis, but there hasn't been a great way to edit that gene or correct this deficiency, and CRISPR and other techniques allow potentially a way to do that. Monoclonal antibodies would be another example of uh, a new technology. So the bottom line is that therapeutics is usually about what can we do today that we couldn't do yesterday. It's a very science first uh, process. The second step, once you have some interesting piece of new science, is indication selection. And a nomenclature aside here, uh, uh, we use indication to refer to diseases very broadly. And we use the term indication because uh, this could include things like acne or chronic pain that generally might not be considered a disease. So going forward, just think of indication as a fancy word for a disease. Uh, and the indication selection process is a fairly involved one. There's thousands and thousands of indications out there. And it's the job of a VC very often to figure out which indications would be the best fit for a particular piece of science. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about indication selection in a minute. Uh, the third part of this process is building out a team. Uh, you know, a CEO, CSO, if it's more clinical in nature, perhaps a, a CMO. Uh, and this is where biopharma is a little bit different than other industries. So in tech, for instance, you might have a charismatic founder or founder CEO who comes to a VC with an idea and some initial traction, maybe a team that they've built out themselves. Uh, but with therapeutics, oftentimes the initiating event is a professor reaching out to us or us reaching out to a professor with some interesting science that he or she has done in his lab, in his or her lab. And uh, then we work with that professor to find indications that could be suitable. And once we've checked both of those, then we will assemble a team. So it's a little bit backwards from other industries, but this is um, quite common in, in therapeutics. Uh, 
Okay, so what makes a good indication? Broadly speaking, there are four categories. Um, and the first is scientific fit. Uh, essentially, we're trying to ask, can this new biology or new technology realistically address this indication? And at this point, we've already verified that the science is robust and reproducible, so we're convinced that there's some sort of platform to be had here. The next question is unmet need. And this is a very nuanced question to try and address. Um, effectively, we're trying to get at how well addressed is this indication by existing therapies? So if a particular disease is very, very serious and as in fatal and has no approved therapies, that's clearly high unmet need. Where it gets more ambiguous is if it's a serious disease that already has approved therapies that just don't work that well. Uh, so the question we're really trying to get at here is how many people with this disease would potentially benefit from our therapy and to what extent? The third question that we think about when we're mapping the indication uh, landscape is competitive intensity. And this is how far along are other people in the space and can our approach realistically be better? So you could have great science, very high on that need indication, but if there's 10 other companies also pursuing that indication, then that's not something we would continue doing. Um, and then the third category, or the fourth category that we think about is market size. Um, so this is how many people suffer from the condition or this indication. And as I mentioned before, under unmet need, how many people with, the, with this disease are refractory to or not responding to existing therapies? So how many people with the disease could our medicine actually address? And this is a really important category to think about uh, because it's a category that for a long time the pharmaceutical industry struggled with. And let me explain. Uh, it is very difficult for an indication to pass the first three filters on this slide. Scientific fit, unmet need, and competitive intensity. It's very rare that all of those three things align. And I want to argue that it would be a failure of our biopharma system if indications were dismissed due to market size. Um, and let's think about why that would be the case. So if I have a horrible disease that really affects my quality of life or maybe is life-threatening, it shouldn't matter whether there are a million other people with this disease or a thousand other people with this disease. If some company somewhere has some science that could potentially address my disease, I would want people to be working on that. Uh, and this is, this is because in the pharmaceutical industry, we really shouldn't be concerned with total misery or total unmet need, but misery or unmet need per person, if you assume that a human life has value and all that. Um, and this is different from other industries. Uh, so for instance, if you are seven feet tall, uh, you basically have to accept that J. Crew may not carry your pant size or might not have the sweater that you really like. There's nothing you can do about it, you just gotta go elsewhere to, to shop. Likewise, if you have some very odd food allergy, you will probably have to accept that some restaurants that you eat at, you can't eat anything on the dessert menu. And I think we're all pretty okay with that. I mean, it's unfortunate when you don't get dessert, but like, we can live with that. However, this would be unethical if the same were true in the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, you can't tell someone, well, there's just not a lot of people like you, and we could help you, but we're not going to. Uh, and this is somewhat uh, uncapitalist. Uh, we need some way around this. Yet, many such indications were in fact passed over prior to, to 1983. And it wasn't for any reasons that were malicious or evil. Uh, as you've probably been able to guess by this point, it just came down to time and money. It's generally not cost effective to make a drug for a small number of people. And let's talk about the time component. So time is something that any drug developer thinks a lot about because we're always running up against patent to expiration. Usually a patent lifetime will be something around 20 years, but that clock starts ticking at the beginning of your clinical trial process. And on average, it takes 12 or more years for a drug to get approved. So you have, let's say, eight years of uh, lifetime on that drug, and it takes some amount of time to reach your peak revenue. So you can see this window is getting narrower and narrower, and this is especially problematic for a rare disease. Uh, the second issue is money. So uh, in the 1980s, it cost about $200 million 
to bring a new drug to market. Now these numbers are all fuzzy, different people will tell you different numbers, but this is order of magnitude. Uh, today, it costs closer to $2 billion to bring a new drug to market. So if you're a pharmaceutical company and you can spend hundreds of millions of dollars making a drug, you would almost always choose to make a drug for a disease that affects more people. Uh, so the Orphan Drug Act of 1983 changed this math and made rare disease drug development actually feasible for uh, pharmaceutical companies. And I should make another nomenclature note here. Uh, orphan disease is any disease that affects fewer than 200,000 people. So it's just a fancy word for rare disease. And this brings us to an interesting point about the pharmaceutical industry. The bad point about this industry is that uh, it is a government-sponsored monopoly. But the good thing about the pharmaceutical industry is that it is a government-sponsored monopoly. So when you have structural problems like this, there might actually be a legislative fix to it. Okay, so how did the Orphan Drug Act actually change this math? There are three main components. The first part is a 50% tax credit. Now this only becomes meaningful once a company starts generating revenue, so some companies never actually see benefit from this, but if you do make it to a point where you're generating revenue, this can be uh, incredibly meaningful. Uh, as I mentioned before, clinical trials easily cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the second key point about the Orphan Drug Act is that it established a grants program. Uh, and this awards, to this day, about 15 million in research grants per year, which in the scheme of things is not a whole lot. However, it has helped bring uh, close to 50 orphan drug products to market. And uh, the third key point, which I would argue is the most meaningful, is marketing exclusivity. Uh, the Orphan Drug Act provided seven years of guaranteed market exclusivity. Uh, and this is uh, particularly important for, for orphan drugs, given what I mentioned before about this patent lifetime. Um, you can imagine, you know, just doing back of the envelope, if an orphan drug generates $100 million in revenue per year, and this guarantees you seven years of market exclusivity, and that's close to a billion dollars that you have um, been granted, depending on how you look at it. The effect of this act has been dramatic. In fact, it's been one of the most dramatic shifts in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, this is cumulative number of orphan drug approvals since the uh, 1960s. So prior to the passage of the Orphan Drug Act in 1983, there were fewer than 40 approved orphan drugs. Since then, um, the cumulative number of orphan drug approvals you know, today is about 800, uh, again, depending on how you count. Uh, but it's made rare diseases a, a very interesting space. And from a VC standpoint, we love rare diseases because of these incentives and because you can get to human proof of concept relatively quickly. Uh, so just seeing it from that side, um, this act has undoubtedly had a, a big effect on the industry. Uh, now, given the year in which this act was passed, and given our proximity to a well-known company in Cupertino, I, I feel something of a need at this point to revisit a wonderful bit of advertising. So I want to convince you tonight that the Orphan Drug Act of 1983 is perhaps the real reason why 1984 wasn't like 1984. Um, and yes, I'm being a little bit facetious, but in truth, the, the prospect of an incredibly bleak 1984 was actually not that far off an ocean for people living with rare diseases, because every year prior to 1984 was a really bleak year for people living with rare diseases. And so the Orphan Drug Act was the catalyst that, that changed this reality. And uh, let's look specifically at a few of the groups of people who benefited from the Orphan Drug Act. So uh, one of the first diseases to, to benefit from, from this act was infant botulism. And this is, you know, thankfully, in many regards, a very rare disease. There's only about 100 cases in the US per year. The bad news about that is it means there's way too few patients for this to warrant attention under normal circumstances from a pharmaceutical company. Um, the other thing to know about infant botulism is that it's a, a serious disease. Um, symptoms often include weakness and paralysis, and it can progress to life-threatening respiratory failure. But today, it's treated with uh, botulism immune globulin intravenous, BIG IV. Uh, and uh, one can say fairly unequivocally that this drug would not have been brought to market or developed without the Orphan Drug Act, 
In fact, it was the grants program that I mentioned earlier that funded the pivotal trial for this drug. Uh, and again, this is now the standard of care for infant botulism and has been shown to reduce hospital stay almost by half and reduce the time that infants need to spend on mechanical ventilation. So you know, a wonderful thing for, for these infants and their families. Uh, the second disease I want to talk about is, is sickle cell disease. So it wasn't too long ago that this was a fatal pediatric disease. Uh, people often didn't live into adulthood. But today, the median survival of someone with sickle cell is close to 60 years. Uh, and that's thanks in no small part to this drug called hydroxyurea. Uh, this is a drug that received orphan drug designation. And uh, in adults uh, taking hydroxyurea, the 10-year survival rate is close to 90%. Uh, in kids taking hydroxyurea, the 15-year survival rate is over 99%. So this is a, a remarkable medicine that has had a big impact on people living with this disease. Uh, and the last indication that I want to talk about uh, in this group is an inherited retinal disease called uh, Leber's congenital amaurosis, abbreviated LCA. This is an extremely rare disease. There's only about 50 new cases per year uh, and about something like 2,000 patients in the US. Uh, and these patients are missing a gene called RPE65 and they will eventually go blind. Um, you start to see symptoms in children, uh, and at that point, uh, prior to this drug Luxturna, it was really just a waiting game. You were uh, going to go blind over time. Uh, however, Luxturna is the result of decades of academic research in the gene therapy space, and they use a virus to deliver the RPE65 gene to these patients, um, effectively uh, restoring their eyesight. It's not perfect, but it's certainly uh, a big improvement over what patients had previously. Uh, my favorite story about Lux Turna is uh, about a 12-year-old girl um, who was one of the first people to receive this therapy. At the time, she was using a cane um, and uh, had extreme difficulty seeing in low light. And uh, she talked about how after she got this uh, therapy, for the first time in her life, she was able to see snowflakes. So if that doesn't make you misty-eyed, I don't know what does, uh, but it's incredible hearing stories like that. The other point I want to make uh, while we're talking about rare diseases is that in total, rare diseases aren't actually rare. There are over 7,000 rare diseases, and the list is growing. And these include diseases that you've probably heard of, like hemophilia and cystic fibrosis, um, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, and importantly, Many cancers are rare diseases. You know, as you might expect, many cancers affect fewer than 200,000 people in the US, including a number of leukemias. Ovarian cancer uh, has received orphan uh, designation, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer. Um, again, this has been an, a very important act for many diseases. Uh, the other point I want to make is that, in total, 30 million Americans have a rare disease. This is one out of every 10 people uh, in the US. Okay, so uh, I hope I've convinced you that the orphan disease space uh, remains and, and was a very high unmet need uh, set of conditions that weren't receiving the VC funding that they should have been. And we can represent this graphically. So if you imagine uh, some quadrants like this where the y-axis is level of venture funding and the x-axis is uh, unmet need. Uh, and again, I'm defining unmet need as misery per person rather than total misery. Uh, orphan disease prior to 1983 was very solidly in this bottom right hand quadrant. Uh, very high unmet need, but low VC funding. The Orphan Drug Act brought it up to this top quadrant where it rightfully should be. But I would argue that today we have a new disease in this lower quadrant, uh, which is chronic pain. Um, extremely high unmet need and actually not getting the level of VC funding that it should be. Okay, so I'm sure all of you have heard about the opioid epidemic and, uh, or maybe have experienced chronic pain yourself, but just a few numbers to put things in perspective. Uh, roughly 100 million Americans have some type of chronic pain, uh, and there are so many crazy statistics about the pain space. Uh, one of them, uh, last year, or every year on average, uh, about 300 million opioid prescriptions are written in the US alone. So that means there's enough 
um, opioid prescriptions to give every single uh, American their own bottle of opioids every year. Perhaps not surprisingly, given that statistic, uh, roughly 12 million Americans have misused prescription opioids, and another 2 million are addicted to opioids. Again, these numbers will vary depending on which sources you look at, but the bottom line is millions of Americans are addicted to, to opioids. This has led to a dramatic increase in opioid overdose deaths. Um, in fact, the increase has been roughly sixfold uh, since 1999. Uh, in 2017, roughly 50,000 Americans died of an opioid overdose. For reference, in 2017, that same year, about 40,000 Americans died in a car accident. So we now have more Americans dying of opioid overdose than in car accidents. And the ripple effects of this are uh, tremendous. So this is a US life expectancy at birth. And since 2015, average US life expectancy has been in decline. Uh, and this is largely driven by opioid overdoses. And one of the terrible things about this is a lot of these overdose deaths are in younger people. Um, we actually haven't seen this degree of decline in US life expectancy for roughly 100 years, actually exactly 100 years. The last time this happened was 1915 to 1918. And to calibrate ourselves, that was during World War I and the Spanish flu. So again, it's really hard to, to capture the true magnitude of this opioid crisis. There is a, an extreme need for safer pain therapies. And of course, there's many ways to address this problem. One would be to change prescribing guidelines, and this is certainly something that the FDA and others are working towards. Um, another would be developing medical devices. Um, I think about the therapeutic space, and so uh, you know, I'm sort of a, a one-trick pony, and this is what I think uh, we should do. But I think there's also a, a reason or an argument to be made for safer pain therapies or therapeutics because it's the existing pain therapeutics that are at the root of this problem. So what would a safer pain therapy look like? I would argue that it should meet two criteria. Um, on the one hand, it should have reduced addictive potential. Um, existing pain therapies generally target the mu opioid receptor, and we know that if you activate this receptor in certain ways, it can lead to dependency and, and addiction. Uh, so ideally, we would either find ways to modulate the mu opioid receptor in ways that don't cause this effect, or we would find new targets entirely. Uh, the second category or the second criterion that a safer pain medicine should have is reduced risk of respiratory depression. Um, the reason why people ultimately die of an opioid overdose is respiratory depression. It affects your ability to breathe. So ideally, a new pain therapy would not have this liability. Now, one could argue that if you have a medicine that's not addictive, then you don't actually need to worry about its effect on respiratory depression. And I think there's some merit to that argument. Uh, but in general, it would be great to have both. So here are some of the solutions that are, are being tried and, and look reasonably promising. Uh, one approach would be what's called biased agonism of the mu opioid receptor. So uh, the mu opioid receptor, very fascinating biology. When it's activated, it can turn on one of two signaling pathways downstream of it. Uh, one of these is called the G protein signaling pathway, and the other is called the beta arrestin pathway. Morphine activates both of these pathways, and there's a fair amount of data suggesting that if you could selectively activate the G protein pathway, you would not have respiratory depression and you might not have addictive potential either. Essentially, these people are saying that activation of the beta arrestin pathway is what's causing these problems with existing opioids. So the goal would be to selectively activate the G protein pathway. And this is something that um, academic labs and a few pharmaceutical companies are working on. In fact, some of the leaders in this space are, are right near us, Brian Kabilka at Stanford, um, the Shoiket Lab at UCSF, and Ashish Mangleek's lab at UCSF. Um, Laura Bone at Scripps, uh, uh, my alma mater, uh, is also doing a lot of great work in this space. A second possible approach would be to just ditch the mu opioid receptor and try to find new targets entirely. Uh, and of course, the cannabinoid receptor is very much in vogue at the moment, um, given the legalization of marijuana. Uh, so THC would not be <laughs> the ideal uh, pain therapy, although it does actually work quite well, I'm told. Um, and that's because THC has psychoactive side effects. Uh, now, 
all of us make molecules that activate the CB1 receptor, uh, but don't have these psychoactive side effects. So the goal would be to make drug-like molecules that can be taken once a day or however frequently you need it, um, that can activate this receptor, mitigate pain, but not have the psychoactive side effects. Uh, a third possible approach would be, again, in this area of new targets, looking at nerve growth factor. So uh, nerve growth factor, or NGF levels, are increased in people with chronic pain. Uh, so the goal would be to safely block uh, NGF signaling using some sort of an antibody. So this is a crystal structure of nerve growth factor in dark blue bound to its receptor in light blue. And uh, several companies are working on making antibodies that block this interaction, including Pfizer, Lilly, and Regeneron. And this approach is probably the furthest along of the approaches that I've just described. Um, Pfizer has completed phase three trials with an antibody against nerve growth factor that they, again, will ho hope will be a um, less addictive uh, pain medicine. Of course, this one has some side effects uh, that still need to be worked out, but um, it's certainly something that people are trying. Okay, so there's um, interesting and compelling scientific approaches. One can never know if this science will work, but it's reasonably compelling as far as uh, preclinical science goes. Uh, yet, there is relatively little VC funding for pain. Uh, and I think this graph helps put it in perspective. So there are certainly companies that have gotten uh, VC backing to explore pain, but for instance, I've spoken with VCs outside of Venrock who have said categorically that they will not invest in pain companies. They will not invest in any opioid company um, and oftentimes won't even take meetings with them. So um, why is that? Well, let's, let's look at where pain is on this chart. So. Uh, on the x-axis is uh, direct healthcare costs in the U.S. And um, you can see pain is very far out on the right. Um, by, by this uh, analysis, it's costing the U.S. over $250 billion. Uh, yet, very little VC funding given the uh, healthcare costs associated with it. In contrast, cancer, I think everyone would agree that cancer is pretty bad, uh, but in terms of direct healthcare costs, it's certainly lower than pain uh, and a number of other indications, yet it gets uh, a lot of, of VC funding. So why would that be? It feels like there should be some sort of solution to this. Uh, we can go back to this funnel that I showed earlier and ask, is chronic pain a good indication? So starting off with scientific fit. Uh, again, you can never know if preclinical data will translate or even early clinical data, but I would say that the data around these new approaches in pain is compelling. Uh, the unmet need is certainly there. Uh, like I said, millions of Americans addicted to opioids and uh, close to 100 million Americans have some sort of chronic pain. Uh, competitive intensity is low, as you just saw on the last slide. There's not a lot of funding or a lot of activity in this space. And market size is certainly enormous. This is the uh, exact opposite of the problem that we saw with rare diseases. There's a ton of people who uh, have trouble with pain. The problem is twofold. On the one hand, uh, pain today is treated with generics, and these generics are incredibly cheap. So over 90% of prescribed medicines for pain have a generic option available, and some of these cost as little as $1 per pill. So yes, that's also a good thing for the healthcare system, but it means that if you're a VC or a small biotech looking to develop a safer pain medicine, again, this is going to cost you potentially hundreds of millions of dollars to develop, and you need some assurance on the other end of uh, when you get out uh, post-marketing that you're going to get more than a dollar per pill. Because if you get a dollar per pill after going through all this expense, you're never going to recoup your costs. The second issue that I think is perhaps more important um, is late de-risking. And uh, what this means is that with a pain medicine, you often don't know until phase three or even later that you have a drug. Uh, so to reimburse at a higher price, insurance uh, payers and doctors need evidence, and, and I think this is totally valid, they need evidence that this pain medicine in fact has lower addictive potential than existing pain medicines. Because the, the sad history of the pain space has been that almost every pain medicine to come out uh, has uh, been touted as having lower addictive potential than the pain medicine before that. And then 
five to ten years later, people realize actually it's just as addictive, just in potentially a slightly different way. So you need a lot of real world human data. And that means thinking about the clinical trial timeline, let's say you take 12 years to get approval, and then you might need five to 10 years after approval of real world data, looking at how people use this, uh, the street value of your medicine, all of these sorts of things to determine addictive potential. So potentially 20 years before you know that you have in fact a safer pain medicine. And we can think about this graphically. Uh, this is what a VC thinks about when they hear late de-risking. So on the y-axis is company valuation, and on the x-axis is time. Late de-risking means that your company valuation doesn't hit this knee in the curve until quite late in its development. Again, it could be 20 years before you know that you actually have a drug and your company valuation reflects that. And again, it's not actually the time that's a problem for a VC. It's about dilution. And we can think about dilution in terms of cost of capital. So cost of capital is effectively how much of a company do I need to give up, let's say for a million dollars of investment. It's going to cost you a lot of money to develop a pain drug and you need to know, let's say it takes $200 million. How much of the company will you have to give up as you're raising those $200 million to get this drug approved? So the cost of capital curve is very much related to the company valuation curve. In fact, these curves can be thought of as just flipping the company valuation curve over a horizontal line, like say y equals a constant. So when your valuation is low, your cost of capital is high because you have to give up a lot more of your company in order to get a million dollars. Um, however, as your company valuation increases, the cost of capital is lower. So if I have a billion dollar company, then I only have to give up 10% of that to get $100 million. Whereas if I have a $100 million company, it's very different math when you want to raise $100 million. Okay, so what does a good indication look like from a VC perspective? Uh, something like this. So the company valuation increases very rapidly uh, with time. And uh, to give you a sense of indications that might fall in this category, uh, cancer therapies today. And that's one of the reasons why in the chart that I showed you earlier, uh, cancer gets so much VC funding relative to other indications. That's because with targeted therapies, you can pick patients in phase one who have the mutation that your drug is targeting, and with 10, 20 patients, you can actually start to see efficacy. So that dramatically reduces the time and cost to human proof of concept, and therefore the time and cost to a uh, reasonable valuation. Uh, companies that tend to have later de-risking in addition to chronic pain include uh, psychiatric disease where uh, there's very big placebo effect. Oftentimes you have to run multiple phase threes in order to get statistical significance. And that's another case where you would have uh, a very late knee in the curve and very high cost of capital for a long time. Okay, so given that, this is what the cost of capital looks like when you have, quote, a good indication. The cost of capital decreases dramatically. So uh, maybe it would take you $20 million to get to a phase one proof of concept, and then the valuation of the company increases 10x, and then you can raise more money at a much higher valuation, less dilution. I hope these graphs have been somewhat clarifying. Um, uh, feel free to, to ask questions. Uh, so let, let's compare the two of them side by side. On the left is late de-risking, again, indications like chronic pain, where you might have to collect real world data on addictive potential or psychiatric conditions where there's high placebo effect and you have to run multiple phase threes. And on the right is early de-risking indications like cancer, which I've already shown you have attracted a lot of VC funding. And what VCs care about is the area under these curves. So on the left, this is a, a very large AUC area under the curve. On the right, much smaller area under the curve. And VCs ca care about area under the curve because that is dilution. The bigger the area under the curve, the more you get diluted and the lower your return is. That probably sounds um, a little bit cold and analytical, but um, as you can see, this is what the VC community needs in order to make an investment. And I think we need to very actively explore ways to make this math work for chronic pain, given the huge unmet need. So how might that happen? Um, well just taking a lesson from the Orphan Drug Act. These are a few things that I came up with, but um, 
I am 100% open to ideas that any of you might have. And like I said, I hope this is uh, thought of more as a brainstorming session uh, as opposed to anything formal. So you could uh, implement a 50% tax credit for companies that are developing drugs for chronic pain. Uh, like I said, this was very meaningful for orphan diseases and could be the same for, for pain. Uh, another way to think about it would be a grants program. Um, BARDA is uh, another government organization that has given hundreds of millions of dollars to the development of uh, antibiotics and has uh, enabled the development of antibiotics for highly drug resistant infections. Uh, I also mentioned the grants program set up by the Orphan Drug Act. Maybe we could try something similar for pain. Uh, and then this third point is um, a little more vague, which is ironic given that it's called clarity, uh, but I would say that the community, the biotech community, needs uh, more clarity on pricing, coverage, access to be expected uh, for uh, new pain medicines. As I said before, there are some VCs I've spoken with who categorically will not invest in pain or new opioids, and one of the reasons they cite is uh, there are already generic medicines available and, and they're really cheap, uh, and how are we going to recoup our costs? Uh, yet when I've talked with payers, they have said that, for instance, chronic back pain is one of their most costly items. It's really expensive to cover someone who has chronic back pain because chronic back pain is really awful. Uh, and so payers have said that they would gladly pay premium pricing um, for uh, a new pain med that's safer. So I think that there's something of a disconnect between what people perceive as the reality and what payers and doctors actually know to be the reality. And I also don't want to end this talk um, giving you the sense that people aren't actively working on this because the FDA is talking about chronic pain and the opioid epidemic almost every week. Um, and here's just a few of the things that they have done or are, are working on. So uh, in May 2018, they launched an innovation challenge uh, to encourage development of medical devices to address the opioid epidemic. Um, they are also in progress or working on building what they call a modern pathway for development of drugs targeting pain. And maybe that will be implementing some of the types of things that I just mentioned, um, uh, TBD. Uh, they are also um, working with uh, medical societies to develop more specific opioid prescribing guidelines, which I think we uh, very much need. Um, and uh, just this week, the FDA said that they're going to start requiring drug companies to show that long-term opioid use is actually effective. Um, you know, obviously there are cases when you need opioids uh, acutely, like after surgery or you break a bone or something like that, but uh, we need more data on whether this is actually the right uh, approach for people who have chronic long-term pain. Okay, so um, I hope I've convinced you that the Orphan Drug Act caused uh, a tremendous shift in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry for the better, and it uh, got people excited about and doing work in an area that was very high on met need, but otherwise overlooked. Uh, and I think that the indication space today that needs a perhaps similar legislative fix is chronic pain. This is killing tens of thousands of Americans per year and affecting millions more. Uh, and we need uh, perhaps some sort of legislative intervention uh, in this space. And again, I want this to be a hopeful talk, not one of doom and gloom. So I really do believe that uh, if we get enough people excited about this and, and thinking about how to incentivize innovation in the space, that we could see uh, some safer pain therapies coming through the pipeline. Uh, and I want to uh, thank, in particular, a few people. Uh, uh, Tina and Nicole are on our marketing team at Venrock, and uh, they made these slides look the way that they did. Um, when I first put together the slides, they did not look as nice. Um, I also want to thank Ray, who put in a ton of hours on these slides. Uh, and I want to thank uh, two of the Benrock partners, uh, Brian Roberts and Bob Kocher, who were really helpful sounding boards as I was thinking about some of the ideas in this talk. And finally, I want to thank Park for hosting this forum and uh, Anna and Shelley for organizing and doing all the hefty, heavy lifting. Uh, so thanks for having me, and at this point, I'll take any questions. Wondering, in term, oh, in terms of total funding, uh, I have a feeling that the, that the genome has caused just a tremendous amount of, of funding in in the genome technologies, mm -hmm. and it seems to me like what you're talking about here is is more chemical or, yeah. or whatever. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But but as this 
rush toward the genome hurt all of this other research funding? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think I personally am very biased towards uh, uh, small molecule chemistry approaches, which I think are generally less sexy than uh, uh, genomics approaches. Um, I think that it has taken a really long time for the genomics approaches to uh, come to fruition um, in the therapeutic space, but I think we are at the point now where um, those sorts of efforts are enabling uh, precision therapies for diseases that we hadn't thought about before. So, for instance, you know, cancer, there are now targeted therapies for cancer. But I now hear people talking about, can we uh, sequence your DNA and figure out better what sort of immunosuppressant might work for you? Let's say if you have multiple sclerosis or, um, or some other autoimmune disease. Uh, just today I was talking with someone about precision ophthalmology. Maybe uh, they can, uh, in the future, sequence your DNA and figure out what sort of uh, eye drops or what sort of medicines might work best for you. So um, I do think that um, it has certainly gotten more attention on the academic side than like traditional chemical approaches, but I think that at this point we are starting to see the fruits of, of that work in, in really exciting ways. Um, we have a question here. Thank you for an excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. So uh, I was wondering, um, you know, the pain in the pain category, ca cancer pain is a big, big problem. Yeah. And so I was wondering how much of cancer pain is in that big pain category where you yeah. see funding is not going. Yeah, that is, that's a really good question. So. Um, so one of the problems with pain is that there are many different types of pain, uh, and I <laughs> glossed over that here, but I think that for some types of pain, we definitely need to better understand what the biological basis is. Um, having said that, um, I have heard uh, increased interest in uh, like neuropathic pain um, associated with chemotherapy. Uh, I don't know if that's specifically the type of cancer pain that you're talking about, um, but uh, so the, the discussion I heard about that was you're not going to get the same sort of pricing you would for an oncology medicine, uh, but it could potentially benefit a lot of people. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why people will stop chemotherapy is because of this chemotherapy-induced uh, pain, which is unbelievable to think about that the pain would be bad enough that someone would stop chemotherapy. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's kind of a rambling answer, but I do think that um, some of these learnings could extend to, to cancer uh, pain, especially as a lot of times today that's treated with, with morphine. So um, if there were better medicines for, for cancer pain, I think that, or for pain in general, I think that they could apply uh, just as well to cancer pain. Yeah, and I have one quick, another question. Um, I was wondering if you would comment on uh, what VCs think about repurposing drugs Mm -hmm. uh, for pain. So it could be yeah. a cancer drug, maybe yeah. it works on calcium or whatever and could be repurposed uh, as, as pain mm -hmm. medicine. Yeah. Um, so another really interesting question. Uh, I would say that there's sort of an ebb and flow in interest in repurposing drugs and right now there's a lot of interest in it. Um, the uh, pro or the reason for repurposing drugs is that oftentimes these already have phase one or even phase two data as you know. and uh, they have been de-risked from a, a safety standpoint. Uh, so I would say there's a lot of VCs who really like um, the idea of repurposing drugs. Um, and uh, so usually how that would be done is you find some asset um, or some drug and uh, try to in license it from whatever company initially developed it. And uh, I would say that's a really active area of research or active area of uh, VC funding. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. May I ask? Um, I'm interested in the fact that the cost of developing a drug has gone from 200 million to 2.5 billion per yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, I have to believe a lot of that has to do with uh, the development cost of trying to get things through the FDA, the, the right. various stages of clinical trials and so forth. Um, you talked about developing a modern pathway for developing pain drugs. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more generally, is there there must be thought about developing a more modern pathway for developing drugs generally. I'm right. thinking about things. Uh, you've talked about the fact that um, 
with sequencing, we can more, more carefully target yeah. exactly what we want to put into the body and whether or not it's going to, uh, it's going to be compatible uh, with mm -hmm. this individual or something yeah. like that. So uh, that, of course, gets over cer certain safety issues and so forth. Um, development of body on a chip or organoids mm -hmm. on chips for, for testing certain things and being able to move farther ahead on, on these, kind of, um, these kind of developments and therefore reduce the amount of cost to yeah. get a drug to market. I'm sure that, that you and yours are, are thinking about this kind of thing. Where are we now in that? Yeah. So another really interesting question. Um, there was a paper that came out of a, a group at MIT uh, earlier this year, and they looked at predictors of success in clinical trials. And to your first point, they found that one of the best predictors of clinical trial success was use of biomarkers to stratify the patients going into it. So I think that, uh, I mean, the use of biomarkers has totally revolutionized cancer development, uh, cancer drug development. Um, in the past, it was everybody gets cisplatin and let's just group them all together and see how it turns out. But now um, it's really a, a much more granular patient selection process. And any time you can um, be more specific about the patient population that you're treating, you can substantially increase your chances of success. So I do think a big part of it will be uh, better figuring out from the get-go before you even treat your first patient who is most likely to respond to the drug. Um, and then to your second point about um, I guess translatability and uh, organs on chip and that sort of thing. Um, there are certainly indications today where we just don't have good preclinical models. And I have certainly seen cases where a company decides not to pursue an indication because there's just not a, a model of it that they can study. Uh, so I think that that is more of a kind of a piecemeal problem. You have to go indication by indication, and it can take a decade to develop a really good animal model. Uh, but we definitely need people working um, in fields where there aren't good animal models to, to fix that problem. So for instance, for psychiatric indications, another problem is it's hard to figure out in a mouse if your antidepressant is having an effect. Um, it's much easier to just measure the size of a tumor or something like that. So it is definitely a, a problem. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Well, um, I, so uh, something we talk about today is that um, is the number of very large biopharma companies that have been built on extremely small patient populations. Um, so I think if you can uh, make a compelling case that you have some drug that has really high probability of success in this specific population, then um, I think that would be really interesting to VCs, and uh, and it would lower the total cost of, of making a drug because it's a smaller patient population with higher probability of success. So I think if we can get better at stratifying patients and selecting which patients to enroll, I think it wouldn't be too crazy to see um, the cost of developing a drug actually go down. So you actually kind of asked a couple similar questions to what I was going to ask, but the first question is, Pain is such a multifactorial problem. Yeah. It's immunological, um, neurological, morphological. Um, are VCs more likely to invest in a drug that is more targeted to a specific disease indication mm -hmm. and potentially expanding on that indication post market yeah. or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, a common strategy that you see VCs taking is like, let's say there's some big market that they're very interested in, but there's an orphan disease um, where one can get to human proof of concept much more quickly. Um, that sort of thing VCs love. You get FDA approval um, for a rare disease and then you can expand uh, either off label or what have you to a, a larger market. Um, you see this especially in uh, cosmetic dermatology. Um, so um, yeah, like people will get approval for a particular cosmetic derm whatever, in a medical disease, uh, and then you can expand off-label to people who want to use it cosmetically. So I, as a follow-on to that, um, we've seen in cancer a lot of really innovative clinical trial design mm -hmm. uh, taking shape, like with basket trials, being able to look at many different cancer types for a mm -hmm. single drug at the same time. Yeah. Um, is there the same type of thing 
happening in pain or mm -hmm. are there any sort of like groups trying to work towards that? Yeah, um, so that's a good point. Um, I actually should have mentioned in response to your question that um, one of the ways that people are trying to reduce clinical trial costs is by doing things remotely. Uh, so you see this being done today for dermatology trials where uh, rather than having to go to a clinical trial center, you can actually just take photos at home of your arm or whatever piece of skin is affected and send that in. Uh, and um, Scott Gottlieb, head of the FDA, has come out and said that he is very much in favor of these types of approaches because it reduces the cost to, to develop a drug. So I think it's interesting to think about whether similar sorts of remote clinical trials could be done for pain. Um, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Maybe some sort of patient reported outcome. Okay. Hi. Um, I am curious with how, let me try to phrase this question, um, and maybe not necessarily focus you, but um, everybody is that I feel like the opioid crisis is not just an effect of, um, well, I had pain in my arm at some point and now I really like these pills, so I'm keep using them. I think there's also a lot of pain in existence. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a very bleak existence and I'd rather mm -hmm. escape that, so I am using um, uh, these drugs as a way mm -hmm. of uh, coping. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious in like, is there any incentive to look into um, sort of this Lebensmerz type of uh, um, um, uh, dealing with pain, mm -hmm. let's call it, yeah, pain, I guess, psychological mm -hmm. pain, um, as opposed to uh, trying to adjust the medication? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so uh, I would say that uh, therapies today for addiction, let's say, are in fact a mix of pharmacotherapy, like a, a drug, and uh, behavioral therapy. So the common approach is you get buprenorphine, which is a drug that um, uh, binds to the new opioid receptor and helps uh, you regain some normal chemistry in, in your brain. But then the other part is you would go to, to therapy or some sort of counseling. And I think you, you hit on the problem with pain, which is that it is both chemical and behavioral. And um, you need both approaches. I think that behavioral alone probably uh, would be a really, uh, uh, it would be an uphill climb because uh, we know that in people who have become addicted to these opioids, that expression of the new opioid receptor has actually been fundamentally altered in their brain. So their new opioid receptor signaling is different than a, than a healthy person. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, um, yeah, right, right, um, yeah, I, I think that um, there are certainly like new mental health um, uh, programs that people are experimenting with. I know less about that, but I certainly um, hope that we think about not only how to treat people who are already addicted, but how to keep people from getting addicted in the first place, yeah. I think part of that will be changing the prescribing guidelines. Um, one of the problems with opioid addiction is that uh, some people don't even realize that they're becoming addicted. Um, so brief anecdote, a friend of mine got into a car accident, was given opioids, and uh, he was taking them as, as prescribed. He was on a plane, and uh, he was about to take the last, second to last pill in this bottle and it fell on the floor and rolled under the chair of the person next to him. And next thing he knew, he was on his hands and knees lifting this person's foot up so he could get this pill. And it was only then that he realized, like, oh gosh, I'm dependent on this. Um, so I think that uh, if you give people fewer opioids to start off with, then you lower the chances of them getting to that state. Um, because the bottom line is, like, you shouldn't leave the hospital with 50 pills. Like, you should leave with, like, two or three and then come back later. Yeah. I don't know if that addressed your question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it's, it's, like, a super important topic. Yeah. Does the rest of the world have a similar methodology for developing drugs and are they developing at the same pace the U.S. is? Yeah. Um, so uh, as far as orphan uh, diseases are concerned, uh, the U.S. was actually something of a trendsetter there, and other countries have since adopted similar acts to the Orphan Drug Act. Um, 
I don't have hard and fast numbers on this, but um, some extremely large fraction of drug development happens in the U.S. Um, other companies that, or other geographies that we tend to follow closely are Japan and um, some European countries. Um, yeah, I would say the development process is probably not too different from, com from country to country, but certainly what happens once a drug gets approved is, is very different. So, um, you know, in countries, for instance, where it's single payer, then you have uh, approval and reimbursement uh, more or less happening at the same time, uh, which has some advantages, um, also some disadvantages, but um, it makes it uh, logistically a little bit easier um, for those countries. Um, uh, yeah, but I'd say there's differences in coverage. So like drugs that might be covered here might not be covered in, in other countries. Uh, but yeah, I would say the approval process, like getting to that point, is not so different at a high level. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm taking too much time. But, but, but just the strategic position of your company or other ventures that are going in to support medical research. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you compete? I mean, are, yeah. are you, do you know with smaller companies generally? Yeah. As opposed to big pharma? Right. Um, so that, that's a really good point, and it's something we think a lot about. So in some ways, it's threading a needle. We want to be in areas where pharma companies are actively acquiring. Um, so for instance, medical dermatology, not very active acquisition space, um, and therefore less enticing to a VC because we want some comfort that at the end of the day someone will buy whatever company we build. But on the same hand, or on the other hand, we don't want um, a big pharma company to be working on the exact same thing that one of our small companies would be working on. Um, so the way I've heard some VCs talk about this is that um, you want uh, an indication or science that's early enough that there is still some discovery work to be done, uh, specifically discovery work that a big pharma company might not take on. Um, however, you want to be doing that work in a therapeutic area that a big pharma company likes. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why it's so hard to find indications that uh, are really worth putting money behind because it is threading this, this needle. And then there's the government, which is, must be, NIH must be putting equal amounts of money in too, I, I would think. Uh, yeah. And the technologies. Yeah, I would say, like, so the NIH is, is funding a lot of academic research, which then um, gets spun out into these sorts of companies. So uh, indirectly, but we are very much reliant on, on government dollars. Uh, and it's, it's absolutely critical that we have that basic research to to provide this pipeline for new drugs. Can I just comment on that? Yeah. I keep hearing these arguments from big pharma when they talk about their pricing. Oh, it costs us so much to develop yeah. a drug. And I read somewhere about the percentage of the new uh, inventions that have been actually funded by government research, which then get mm -hmm. uh, exploited by yeah. big pharma. Do you have any idea what the percentages of those are? Oh, what percentage of drugs that come to market today have or been started in a federal lab? I mean, my sense would be like all of them, but I assume it's less well, than. Well, I was thinking fifty percent, but. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, um, so I'm I'm afraid uh, we don't have any time for any more questions, but um, you're more than welcome to come and um, ask Megan a question afterwards. Um, so. Please um, join us next. Uh, please join us next month uh, for the next Park Forum, um, creating a new reality for learning on VR, um, right here in this auditorium on March 21st. Um, so thank you all very much for coming today, and um, thank you to Megan as well for. Her <laughs>